I am Marion Grant. I am the uh, Director for Policy and Professional Engagement at the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, CTAC. And I am very excited to be part of today's presentation because models, it, this is what we have needed. And uh, it's wonderful to hear these stories of all of these different programs really doing things in similar ways in different ways across the country. So we've had a lot of great and empowering and inspiring patient stories. So I thought I would tell not one of those, but I would tell not such a good story. So in addition to being here in Washington doing policy, I am also a nurse practitioner and I work as a palliative care provider up in Baltimore at the University of Maryland Medical Center, where I will be tomorrow morning because it is my Friday to be in the hospital. And um, even though I am a huge believer that palliative care should be delivered from early in the diagnosis on, the reality in a large hospital is we often get called very late in the game. Uh, and we get called urgently. So uh, we got a call a couple of weeks ago about a patient, and we got a call from the ED, which is an unusual referral source for us. And they, I had to get down there right away because there was an 80-year-old woman there. This was her sixth ED visit in seven weeks. And she was about to be admitted for the fifth time in those seven weeks to my hospital, who knows where else she might have been admitted in between that. We don't have electronic health records that, you know, we can share, so the hospital three miles away could be in another continent for all I know. And she was 80 years old. Um, she had had two recent heart attacks. She was very much struggling with end-stage heart failure and cancer. And uh, I looked in the chart before I ran down there to see, uh, you know, what was going on. And the, the, the request was, please come and talk to her about goals of care, because this is crazy, right? She's back. Okay. So I look in the chart, and I see she has had multiple conversations with palliative care before. Uh, some of my colleagues have talked to her. And we have tried to send her home twice so far with home hospice which she said yes to, but then there's a note from the hospice that says, when we go to the house, they don't let us in. I looked for notes about the family. Um, she has a daughter. Uh, she has two daughters. One is very much the spokesperson, but she works during the day, and she's impossible to reach by phone. So family meetings have been very difficult. Um, the hospital, of course, recognized her high risk for readmission because of her high level of readmission, and had engaged the hospital's transition team, right? This is the case manager that tries to keep you from coming back to the hospital. And that case manager had called this woman the day before and said, how are you doing? And she said, I'm fine. And then 10 hours later, she's in the ED with chest pain. So I rushed down to the ED, where she is, of course, not there because she has subsequently been admitted. Now she's up in the cardiac Inten uh, intermediary care unit. So she's not quite, you know, hooked up to a lot of things. But I go up to find her, and I stop to talk with the team. And the, the uh, very young resident says to me, you can see her, but we're about to move her to oncology. Because we think the problem, it's a plural effusion. We think the problem is oncology. And like, I'm done. I need the bed. I'm done. We're going to move her. And I'm like, this is crazy. So I go to talk to the patient who honestly has a very limited understanding of her situation and seems rather comfortable in the hospital. The nurses know her by name. Everyone knows the family story. The social worker intercepts me on my way in to the patient and says, I don't know how productive this is going to be. We have all tried this a million times. So um, I, I, I did not have a fruitful conversation. It was not my usual profound conversation. I was not able to persuade her to do anything different. And I have to say, I left that interaction and, and thinking, OK, so she obviously is comfortable to be in the hospital. And maybe her family is comfortable to be in the hospital. And maybe hospice is, as we've talked numerous times today, not the right thing for her. But this is not a good situation for my hospital. And I wish that young resident, although I did say something to him about stewardship and his lack thereof, because it's like not a good thing. And he doesn't, he wants her, him out of her, his unit, but you know, where she goes next is, is somebody else's problem. But I couldn't help but think if only my hospital had 
a comprehensive home-based program. I have trouble believing that if we had not enrolled this woman a few weeks or months earlier, that we might have been able to keep her out of the hospital at least a few more times. So I am very much, um, as a clinician, waiting for more excellent programs to come because maybe this is fine for her, but this is not the right way to practice medicine. And I, I think she, you know, the bouncing back and forth can't be good for her. So we have a, a panel now that's going to talk about comprehensive care. So we've approached the, the, the different uh, panels from different topics. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. David Wenzel, who has a very interesting history. He is the medical director at Midland Care. Now, he, he went into medicine after becoming a hospice volunteer after the death of his grandparents. He has a certificate in theology. He was the first fellow at Mercy Medical Center North Iowa in hospice and palliative medicine. He has started several palliative care programs at several hospitals, completed a year-long certificate program in medical ethics at the National Catholics Bioethics Center, is very active in growing the PACE program at Midline and at Midland, and is apparently also a master electrician. <laughs> a great skill set. Our next speaker is Dr. Sachem Jain. He is president and CEO at the Care More Health System, an innovative health plan and care delivery system with $1.2 billion in revenue, over 100,000 members in eight states. And Care More is focused on caring for high risk, high cost, complex patients. He is also consulting professor of medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine and a contributor at Forbes. And then our last but not least speaker is Teresa Toland. She began her journey 25 years ago in community health and served for 13 years as the executive director at a large health home care company where she provide, helped provide certified home health services, private duty, and transportation services. She is now the CEO of Tandem 365 where she is responsible for a startup business where there is no blueprint or conditions of participation. She spent the past six years getting to know the healthcare systems in her community and connecting in a positive way. And she firmly believes, as I think almost everyone in this room does, that healthcare will continue to fail in its effort to deliver high quality care if the focus is always and perhaps only about the cost of delivering that care. So Dr. Wenzel, take it away. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna show a short video to kind of to tie up the kind of story ideas that we've been talking about a little bit um, to show you what a PACE center looks like and a, a, a couple of our patients to sort of describe what, the, what they get from PACE. So. PACE is a program of all-inclusive care of the elderly. It is an interdisciplinary way of providing hope, comfort, and support to keep frail elders living in their homes rather than in nursing facilities. I've always found nice people, but there was something about Joel here, and the way they took care of my wife, you know, it was about two months before she died. And so I fell in love with PACE. To be a PACE program, you have to have a transportation department, you have to have an adult day center, you have to have a clinic, you have to have an interdisciplinary team that consists of physicians, nurses, social workers, dietitians, physical therapists, occupational therapists. They just about hit every part of your life that need to be hit. If you're having problems in your home, they might uh, come out and talk to you about it. And you can come and mingle with people that wouldn't go out and talk to them and be their friend. If I need a nurse, she was there on the spot. And if I'm at home, I can call on the phone and find out what I need to do. If they come into PACE versus going into a nursing home, they live on average about 36 months longer than the person who goes into a nursing facility. We build a plan of care that wraps services around them and their families to keep them living in the community. So it, it's no surprise that patients living in the community actually live longer and report their quality of life is better. So that, to me, is a, a real story about what PACE is really about, I think. Um, so I've heard many of the panelists talk a little bit about PACE. So I've been a PACE medical director 
eight or nine years, and the organization I work in is actually started as a nonprofit hospice. Opened up the very first hospice house in the state of Kansas back in the 80s. So I mean, hospice at our core in terms of who we are, nonprofit serving the community, with the development of palliative care services in the community, in the local hospital, and the cancer centers there, and then also went on to develop a PACE program. What drew me to PACE was I, I, was, I came to medicine really late in my life. Didn't go to med school until I was in my 30s. And did it out of an ideal of really wanting to serve others and to help people where they were at. But when I got into residency, that's not what medicine is, right? My residency faculty members were saying, you know, you, you have to see 40, 30, 40 patients a day. And we got a bill, and we got it. And I, I said, well, why do we have to do that? Because that model didn't look like it worked. Even in residency, it didn't work. And so I began looking for models of care or ways that I could provide primary care to frail, vulnerable populations and serve them where they're at rather than where I wanted them to come to be. And so I did a family medicine residency, then a hospice palliative care fellowship because hospice and palliative care felt right to me. But then there's all the limitations with that in terms of the length of stays and the, you know, the restrictions and the six months or less. And, I, you know, I don't know, I, I had the great fortune of training under the program where Ann McGregor started in, in Iowa. She's one of the founders in hospice in the country. And she just mentioned to me that when they were developing the Medicare hospice benefit, someone thought that six months or less would be a good idea. It was just sort of, oh, six months or less. That's how it came to me. And so that didn't, that didn't work because the length of stays are shorter. And so PACE is really a model of care that goes way beyond that in terms of its comprehension. And, it, and I tell people all the time in, in the PACE world, in, in terms of primary care, I'm providing palliative care. Our teams are providing palliative care, end-of-life care, hospital, you call it whatever name you want to call it. But these patients aren't living but about three years, two and a half, three years from the time they come in. And we provide them all-inclusive care throughout that trajectory of wherever they're at, where, meet them wherever they are. So the outline of my talk is here. I don't need to review that. So PACE is, I think, really a proven model of care for very frail older adults, and it's fully integrated. It's community-based, it's very comprehensive, and it is capitated. So we only get so much money per month to provide everything we do for these patients. But it is a way to pay for the home health aides if they need it, or the community workers if they need it, or the transportation if they need it. Whatever they need, we develop it as a team. And then it is really, really coordinated in a way that I've never found any other place in medicine where that actually works. So, for instance, the cardiologist may, I may send a patient to see the cardiologist and they may want to do some crazy exotic thing and I'm going, nope, we're not doing that. And they're like, well, how can you tell me to do that? I said, because I control the dollars. And we're not doing that because it's not appropriate for that patient, right? But it's in the development of those relationships I can coordinate that care with them. So that's one of the great things about PACE. It is truly interdisciplinary. Now, we've used that. I've heard that word a lot here, and I've seen different members, and you heard me even on the video, right? So I didn't even include all of our interdisciplinary team members, right? So we have at our interdisciplinary team meetings, which we have twice a week, doing our care planning of these very for elders, we have transportation at the table, we have the home health aides at the table, we have the community caseworkers at the table, we have everybody involved. We have the caregivers, their family, come in and help us actually develop the plans of care. Can you imagine that? I mean, that's, that's pretty amazing that we bring all those people together to actually coordinate the care of very frail elders. So our interdisciplinary team is even above what you normally see in the hospice setting, way above, because we bring everybody together that's caring for that person. And it is team managed rather than individual case managers. It's continuous in terms of the assessments. Medicare requires that PACE programs do a minimum of Every six months, complete reassessment and review a plan of care. But we often do that more, uh, much more often than that, especially when there's changes in condition of the patients or participants, it is what we call the people that are in PACE, the participants as they, as they change, as their conditions change. And it's really a focus on not only primary, secondary, but tertiary prevention. And it is fully integrated palliative medicine and end-of-life care all the way. And the teams never change. It's the same group, the same people, the same nurses, the same home health aides. We don't change them and say, okay, now you got to go some other team or whatever. So it's, it's fully integrated. 
it is, uh, we get a capitated rate adjustment, adjusted for the frailty of the PACE enrollees, and there's been a couple people up here talk about the risk adjustment frailty of their participants. So ours, our, our average risk scores are about 3.2 or something like that. So they're very, very frail, very sick, often been in the hospital a bunch. They come into PACE. We stop all of that. Um, and then it is truly integrated, Medicare, Medicaid, and private pay. So it's all of those things. Now, so what about scale? And what are some of the challenges we have with that? Well, it's certainly limited by the type of person you can serve. So you have to be 55 or older. You have to be certified by the local area agency on aging to be at nursing home level of function. So they do a functional assessment screening and determine if they're appropriate, which does not allow PACE programs to cherry pick only the healthiest patients. So we don't get to cherry pick anybody. We have to take everybody that comes. Um, it's a time and investment that's really difficult because of it is a reliance on the center, so those four walls, but we've broken away from that a lot because we've partnered with many of the communities in our rural areas, and now we're using community doc waivers where we have physicians in the, in the rural communities that we partner with and bring those services directly to those communities. So it, it isn't just everybody's in pace has to come to the day center. They don't have to. Uh, only about 25, maybe 30% of our participants actually come into the day center on a regular basis. Uh, but one of the difficulties is it's very inconsistently supported by sometimes state and federal programs. So because federal and state often focus on managed care, and it's, that's drawn a lot of uh, resources away from PACE. Um, and then providers, too, are often reluctant to assume that full financial risk, but PACE is at full risk because not only are we there, we're there Medicare A, B, C, D, whatever number, letters you want to come up with, we're all of that. So we have to be their Medicare D part providers. We have to be their A and B providers. We're, we're all of it. And, and then the last thing is expanding sort of the opportunities. We have an opportunity to expand the service population. So the PACE Innovation Act was passed, given authorization to PACE to pilot and serve expanded range of populations. That's been passed already. We're waiting for the, for the, uh, the CMS to release it for requests for proposals to actually do that, so populations under 55 that might benefit from that kind of care. Also options for increasing service capacity in terms of like when I started our PACE program, our state had our program capped at 50 patients, which is crazy because you can't, you can't scale a program and, and, and make it survive with 50 patients. That's not possible. Now the, we, we had the cap lifted or we were able to get our state to release that about three or four years ago. Now uh, our PACE centers, we have three PACE centers in four different counties, across four different counties that are serving about 230, 240 patients. We service actually about 15 counties though, so it's a much broader area. Um, and then last, uh, the next thing then is really looking at federal state policy interest because there is a, I think a heightened interest from all payers in terms of that capitated provider-based solutions. And I think PACE is one of them. It's a good one that provides the level of support and services to patients and their families or caregivers. And then I think many health providers are now interested too in terms of that kind of care. So let's talk about quality reporting. PACE is by far the most, I believe, regulated form of medical care in the United States. Every time, it's gonna to happen to me again in June. Every two years, CMS is in the state or on our campus looking over all of our quality measures, all of our charts, looking over everything we do, which is really good, but it, it causes us to sort of keep up and stay up on all this stuff. So, and so we do level one, level two reporting, and here's all the, the quality measures that we have to report, lots of them. <laughs> I mean, we are constantly sending data through HPMS and that sort of stuff, so we're, we're submitting a ton of, of, of quality measures. Um, and then uh, in 2013, uh, MPA partnered with Econometrics to, to develop the quality measures for PACE. Those were adapted, adopted in January this year, and you see them there. Acquired pressure ulcers, fall rates, falls with injury, depression, living in the community or in a nursing home, and advanced directive. Those are the quality measures that we've been reporting those all along through the data sets from PACE, but th those are going to be reported through to CMS. Um, and then they issued the Federal Registry notice in December about those, so help. So all that stuff's being uh, put through HPMS now, which is great because we can compare. Uh, PACE has lots of comparative data in terms of populations of we serve versus those in the nursing home and that sort of stuff. So we can look at it directly through that 
do that. So the average PACE participants, 72 years of age, has on average 15 diagnoses, uh, takes 10 and a half medications a day, uh, lives an average of 32 months. That's last year, but it changed a little bit every year. Has a deficit at least in two ADLs. The medication one's interesting to me. My current, our PACE Center current record for medications was we had an 82-year-old lady who came to us, joined our PACE program, and she had a primary doctor and I think four subspecialists following her. She was swallowing, I kid you not, 52 pills a day. That's, that's not only crazy, that's malpractice, right? I mean, that's just insane. And so we do as much deprescribing as anything. And I didn't mention on our interdisciplinary team, we have a PharmD who's right there. So because we are their Part D provider, so we are also monitoring their anticholinergic burden scores, their sedative burden scores, their QT prolongation additive scores. So we're monitoring all of that all the time for our participants. Um, so that's the average PACE person. So, so we integrate palliative medicine by enrollment. We do complete advanced directives immediately with the patients, caregivers. We immediately uh, determine their goals of care. We complete the pulse forms with them, which in, in, in the state of Kansas, that's called TPOP. Uh, we have 100% participation in that. We were, our PACE Center was one of the first pilot projects for that in our state. Uh, we review those documents a minimum of every six months and at annual assessments or sooner if there's a change in condition. Uh, because Medicare, again, requires those as minimums. Um, and then we aggressively treat any symptoms that impact quality of life, always. So every, all of our team members are, are cross-trained in palliative medicine, end-of-life care, primary care. They're cross-trained about all of those. So this was just one of the things published about PACE in the Journal of American Geriatrics about the difference between where people in PACE die versus those in usual care or in nursing homes. And you can see... Uh, Probability of death at home and PACE was twice as great for PACE participants as it was a general population. 21% uh, of PACE participants died in the hospital compared to 53% in the Medicare beneficiaries, and then 45% of PACE participants died at home compared to 20%. Uh, now, dying at home is not the objective. It's where the patient wants to be, right? And so making sure they're dying where they want to be. That was the metrics of how we, they determined that. I'm not going to bore you with that. Um, this is, again, looking at the side effects, the differences between across the United States. There's now 141 PACE sites, and so there's some variation between the PACE sites in terms of where the people live and where they die. So here's the top policy priorities. Enhance PACE affordability and access to Medicare-only beneficiaries. Uh, ensure any Medicaid, Medicare, congressional reforms continue to support vulnerable population, because that's what PACE serves more than anything else. The majority of our Patients are either Medicaid only or duals. Um, release, we, we need CMS to release that final PACE ruling. And then obviously the pilots for request for proposal on the new pilot programs of serving younger population. Those are our sort of asks. I, I ask all of my, you know, Pat Roberts and Senator Moran and Lynn Jing, all the people that are in my state, I'm constantly talking to them about, hey, guys, come on, we need this. We need Because they've all been to our PACE Center. They've seen what the population we're serving is like. And so those are the things that we're really, really asking about. Now, that was, <laughs> that's probably the fastest presentation of PACE in the world. That only touched the surface of what PACE really is. And I'll be happy to answer questions later or talk more. So. <laughs>